Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, chasing the past through the long and narrow pipelines of history. Joining me, as always, from a remote corner of the Cross Time Pub is my good pal Jason Pentrail. How are you, sir? Hey, doing great. Glad to be back on the mic. Uh, we're over here checking off holidays on the other side of Thanksgiving and headed toward Christmas. Absolutely. But I have a question for you, my friend. Where is James Waldo? And guess what? I have an all-purpose answer for that, too. He's at home! Who was in his tight? <laughs> That's right. Of course, I mean, with a name like Waldo, did you really expect you'd be able to find the guy very often? Well, you know, that's one thing with Seven Ages, guys. We're always busy doing something, and, you know, that's no, <laughs> that's no different for James because he is moving into his new home in Arkansas. That's right. Well, allow me, by the way, uh, to welcome the new addition while we're here on the mic together, because last time it was just James and I flying duo, because you were busy. You quite literally had your hands full with a small human being. (laughs) Yes, uh, absolutely. So we've welcomed our new son into the world, and he got here a little bit early, about five weeks early. So uh, surprise for us. Happy holidays. But he's doing fine, and mom's fine, baby's fine. And uh, we are you know, dealing with not sleeping and all the good things that go along with a brand new baby, but everybody's happy and we're happy to be on the other side and moving toward the new year with a new family member. That's right. As the original little man keeps getting bigger and bigger, you're going through it all over again. It's time for round two. Yeah. So that's always fun. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I look forward to doing that one day myself. You know, the, the joy of having children, the joy of not being able to sleep for the first two years of their young life. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's always something, but it's always an adventure. That's for sure. Yeah. You are a Star Wars fan, correct? Uh, somewhat. My older brother is really a Star Wars fan. Um, I was always more of a Tolkien. Tolkien fan, Hobbit, things like that. But yeah, you know, I I like Star Wars. I mean, I like them all. I like all of it. And uh, I enjoy Gandalf as much as I enjoy Obi-Wan. But yeah, this holiday season, those folks at home who have access to the Disney Plus medium online, their new streaming service, have probably been doing what I did, which was getting caught up on The Mandalorian. And yes, I think I transmogrified into a tiny little baby Yoda last night as I was asleep. Yeah, well, you know, Again, talking to my brother, he was very excited about this. Um, he's a lifelong Star Wars fan. Uh, he was born in 1970, so he, you know, has followed that series since that time when he was a child. And uh, he's, you know, catching up on that. And he also spent uh, a good chunk of the holidays playing uh, Star Wars Galaxy online. So that's his <laughs> other obsession is that particular game. Yeah, I used to play the video games back in the day. I just don't really have time for them uh, right now. As you know, I've got this wonderful uh, little journey to Portugal and the Azores coming up here in just a few days. And so it's been a mad rush to get podcasts together uh, in advance of that. Now, Of course, Portugal isn't the only part of the world where they speak Portuguese, Jason. And in fact, if we head a little further south to Sao Paulo, Brazil, right now there's news. And I actually quote here from the New York Times that President Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil has falsely claimed that the Hollywood star Leonardo DiCaprio financed the fires recently set in the Amazon rainforest. Where does he come up with this stuff? I do not know, but that's very interesting. So what angle are they taking on that? I don't know, but really it seems, I'll just again read here from the report. It says it was the latest attempt by the right-wing leader to shift blame for fires that have focused international concern on his government, which is scaled back efforts to fight illegal logging, ranching, and mining in the Amazon. But the reason I bring this up is not because of the conspiracy intonation there about Leonardo DiCaprio funding fires that are destroying the Amazon right now. 
I actually want to put this into the context of archaeology because I heard an interview, and I've got a little snippet from this that we'll feature in a moment, from an archaeologist, and many are concerned about the loss that is occurring down there, not just environmentally but archaeologically, in the Amazon. The Guardian, reporting the other day, noted that recent findings, quote, are radically changing our understanding of the region's prehistory. New evidence suggests that pre-Columbian Amazonian civilizations were comparable in scale and complexity to better-known Andean and Mesoamerican cultures. They had populations, they say, numbering in the millions, living in interconnected, fortified villages. They left rock art, vast ceremonial earthworks, sprawling irrigation channels and causeways, but any stone buildings described in fanciful accounts by conquistadors have not survived. Perhaps even more intriguingly, a growing body of research suggests that much of the world's largest rainforest was molded by humans. And for a little more on that, she was speaking with NPR the other day, but uh, archaeologist Cristiana Barreto spoke about the kinds of things that they're finding and just how populated that area of the Amazon once had been. We have that audio. The forest that we all thought was virgin and untouched, it's in fact a forest that has been managed by indigenous peoples for thousands and thousands of years. We have villages that are really, really very large. We're mm -hmm. talking thousands of people. Uh, it was like one village after the other. So we estimate that before the Europeans arrived, we would have between 6 to 10 million people living in the Amazon. That's quite a number. It's quite a number indeed, but... I mean, that's just fascinating because they're saying, essentially, here's the deal, Jason. They can't get down there, really, in those very inaccessible and remote regions of the Amazon to actually study the archaeology. And as the burnoff is ensuing and they are out there fighting the fires, we're beginning to see things. And that's good. But, of course, we're also concerned about what might be destroyed. But they're saying, yeah, they were actually working that land. And this so-called virgin forest wasn't virgin at all. It had been worked probably for centuries or maybe thousands of years in truth, there are earthworks, petroglyphs, all kinds of things turning up down there. Yeah, it's just one more area that archaeology is going to continue to expand into. And, and like they talked about, they thought it was, you know, virgin forest untouched because of the density. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, you know, I think there's very few areas uh, in North, Central and South America that are completely untouched. They've, they've all had people move through at some point over the last 15 to 20,000 years. And I think as technology begins to build, like we're seeing with LIDAR and ground penetrating radar, all these uh, technological advances are going to move us forward. But at the same time, we're seeing happen down there, same things that happen in North America with the advent of heavy agriculture, you know, the plowing of the mounds and the d destruction of uh, the Mississippian culture sites, the woodland culture sites. Uh, it's the same thing that happened here as people began to clear the land and work the land is now beginning to happen down there with deforestation, forest fires, and all the other environmental impacts that they're seeing down in that particular area. Right. You know, one of the other issues here is that as Bolsonaro continues to try and point the blame, Leonardo DiCaprio isn't the only guy with a target on his back. The indigenous communities down there have also been targeted because many of them engage in controlled burning, which can actually help renew areas of forest when it's done in a manageable way, which they always do. But he has tried to blame them for some of the fires as well. And uh, The Guardian here goes on to say that archaeologists across the Amazon warn that progress with regard to archaeological work, of course, is imperiled by the policies of Brazil's nationalist president. The field is facing dramatic funding cuts, and while proposed legal changes on salvage archaeology will endanger priceless physical evidence as well. And that's not to even touch on the displacement of the indigenous communities down there right now. And this not only because of the fire, they say also resulting from Bolsonaro's promises to turn the Amazon over to loggers, miners, and farmers, as we mentioned, in the name of development. This risks destroying the local knowledge needed to reconstruct the Amazon's past and potentially safeguard its future. I'd like to hear from our friends in the archaeological community out there. How do you guys feel about that? We're just beginning to learn these things about South America's past, and they may be destroyed like so many other important discoveries before we can even get down there and learn those things. We'd love to hear from you. Write to us, jason at sevenages.org or micah at sevenages.org. We always like hearing from you guys. And in fact, we've heard from a few of you guys recently because we continue to receive donations from our fine friends like George Howard at the $20 level and of course, Christina Frawley at the $10 level who have continued to support this podcast monetarily. And also, we had a new donation the other day at the $5 level from Eric Eads, who writes, Just discovered you guys and your show. I love it. Keep up the fabulous work. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Welcome to the fold. 
And you guys keep sending those donations because what that does is that helps us to not only promote archaeology, but we also put time out uh, into the field. We often volunteer on sites with friends like Christopher Moore, PhD, and others. You know, we like to put a little blood, sweat, and tears behind our interests, not just talk about it. And, you know, you got to pay for gas and lodging and things like that. So uh, what we do is always in an effort to try and promote broader awareness of history in the past. And, you know, Jason, again, I know that this is something that our listenership appreciates. So thank you guys for showing support. If you'd like to so show support, head over to sevenages.org, and there's a button right there that says support seven ages with PayPal. It's easy to do, and we appreciate all of it, especially around the holidays. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, and, and not only monetarily, but if you can reach out and do those rates and reviews, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media, at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, uh, that's greatly appreciated as well. That's right. Now, uh, you and I have been on the road a bit together, my man, uh, just before the arrival of the little one. Before we get to uh, our adventure over in Tennessee, we actually spent some time here in North Carolina uh, traveling out to some of these enigmatic Carolina bays. But rather than to share our own experiences out there, and we had some great times with some fantastic folks and even some listeners of this program, uh, there's another gentleman who I want to talk about. Actually, I'd like for you to talk about him because uh, one of our many field correspondents and friends assisted in obtaining an interview with this gentleman about this very subject. Our field correspondent, Dan Newbanks, had the opportunity to sit down with Southern writer Tom Poland. Now, Tom's interesting in the way he does things. Uh, he travels uh, back roads, country roads, looking for ruins and abandoned places, uh, captivating people. And he turns all of these things into you know, magazine articles and books. He's the author of 14 current books and his new offering on the Carolina Bays, a long discussed subject here on Seven Ages Audio Journal, uh, will be available coming this December. So again, our field correspondent and Seven Ages alumni, Dan Newbanks, had the opportunity to sit down with Tom Poland and discuss his new book. All right, Tom Poland, I'm here with you uh, in Columbia, South Carolina, and you are by trade an author, correct? An author writer, and author a lot of writer. speaking these days based on books I've done. Okay, and uh, let's see, you've got a book, a new book coming out on a, a topic that's near and dear to our hearts at Seven Ages Research, uh, which is Carolina Bays. The Carolina Bays. Tell us a little bit about about what you have focused on on your new book that's uh, going to be coming out here. Well, <clears throat> Robert Clark, the photographer, and I spent six years in the field, and a seventh year going back and forth with the publisher. You know, on the proofing the pages and making changes and all that. But six years in the field, our angle really is to sort of tell the story in general because there's a lot, there are a lot of people out there that don't know what the bays are, and we want to generate some support for not only uh, protecting them but restoring bays that have been uh, disturbed by man's efforts such as, uh, you know, draining them and plowing them for crops, cutting the timber out. Uh, they've been ditched in a number of places for various reasons, and if you give a bay a chance to hold its water again, it will resume what it once was, which is a great natural ecosystem for a lot of different species. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think your approach is a really neat one. Uh, we we at uh, Seven Ages and, and a lot of our friends are focused on the past of the bays, but you're actually more more focused on what's going on with them now, isn't that right? Now, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and in the future, the future, you know, because if you if you plug a bay that's been ditched and drained, it will restore itself mm -hmm. in and of itself. The yeah. waters return, the indigenous wildlife returns, the plant life returns, and it'll resume what it once was, which is to say it's sort of a, a dish garden set in the coastal plain. Beautiful places. So um, let's stop there. Some some of our folks might not even know what the <clears throat> Carolina Bay is as much as, uh, you know, even we've talked about it here on, on our program. Um, but it, from your perspective, what is a Carolina Bay? Well, to me, and I think most of the experts would agree, it's an elliptical-shaped wetland depression that sits above the water table in the coastal plain. Most are not fed by springs or creeks or um, streams. They collect seasonal rains. They're all elliptical-shaped, parallel, with a northwest to southeast orientation. So if you look at them on um, Google, just Google aerials of Carolina Bays, you'll be astounded to see the patterns they create, and they were discovered in the 30s by some aerial surveys in Horry County, the Fair, Fairchild Aerial Survey Company, and all of a sudden people thought, man, they must have been created by a meteorite bombardment, and that's what they look like. They look like craters on the moon, but they're not, and so it's um, different theories, about 17 different theories that try to explain what created them, 
but none have really gained a lot of acceptance other than just one. Mm-hmm. That would be Ray Kazarowski's oriented wind and wave action theory. He did his work here at USC in the 70s. It states a good case for how they're formed by prevailing winds over a long period, a lot of time. But that doesn't take away the mystery, though. People still don't know what created the depressions in the first place that eventually assumed these elliptical shapes and became a host to such a rich diversity of wildlife. Mm-hmm. They just don't know. And um, you're, as much as your book is focused on um, the present and the future, you do touch, I know uh, I've seen some of the, the excerpts from the book, and you do touch on some of the various theories. Uh, we do. We do. You know, at least briefly. Uh, some of the theories are very uh, interesting. Some people will shake their head. Uh, one theory is that giant beaver dams created them. Another theory is that they're whale nesting grounds. I don't even think whale really nests. They're mammals. And, <laughs> uh, dinosaur footprints, just crazy theories like that. And then there's some theories that, you know, the meteorite bombardment theory. Um, Henry Savage, a Camden attorney, put a book out in 82 uh, from the USC Press, same place that did our book about the meteorite theory. It's, it's been uh, proven it wasn't meteorites. And then lately there's a theory that an icy comet hit the Saginaw Glacial Fields uh, 30,000, 50,000 years ago and scattered out a slurry of debris eight miles high in the atmosphere that came down across the coastal plain and created these uh, Carolina Bay phenomenons, as it did in Nebraska, too. There's some Carolina-like bay formations there. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about what you know about the the ones in Nebraska. Have you have you actually been out there? I or? have not been out there. I've studied them. <clears throat> I've looked at them from photographs. They're um, very similar. They have a, a, a parallel orientation also. And interestingly enough, um, there's a sign, an amateur scientist by the name of Michael Davios, who's a member of CENTOS, and I can't remember exactly what that stands for. He did a, some plotting and, and uh, corrected for the Coriolis effect and ran the axes from the Nebraska-Carolina Bay formations and our coastal plain formations, which stretch from New Jersey to Florida. And interestingly enough, the um, the lines of convergence took place over Saginaw, Michigan. So he has this theory about a comet that hit up there and, and created them. Yeah. A lot of people laugh at that. Well, it's, it's getting to be a, a fairly popular theory. The problem with that theory is if a celestial bombardment of some sort created them, they would all have the same age. Right. But Bay's ages range dramatically, and so that's one of the stumbling blocks he faces. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I said, it's one of the Earth's most, maybe the most mysterious landform we have on planet Earth. Hmm. That's quite a statement. It is. It is. <laughs> right here in our backyard. Right yeah, here. Right. Yeah. So in uh, speaking of uh, in our backyard, how many Carolina Bays are there, and how many of them are in the uh, general vicinity here? Well, we have a lot of them right here in South Carolina. North Carolina and South Carolina have a, a great number of bays, and that's one way they got their names, because they're in the Carolinas. Bay does not have anything to do with a, a water impoundment. It's a reference to the bay trees, which grow in these uh, landforms. are very um, heavily grown over with bay trees, Red Bay, Laurel Bay, and so forth. So you get the name Carolina Bay, which I said in the book is sort of an unfortunate name because it confuses people right off the bat. Mm -hmm. There's probably half a million of them or more. LIDAR, light image distance and ranging, is now detecting more bays than we thought. So it could be a million of them. They're very very common. And like I said, if you'll Google uh, aerial photographs of Carolina Bays, you'll be astounded at what you see. They overlap. They're curved than each other. And they're all parallel. It's a really interesting thing to see because you do think. Man, that's like a bombardment of some sort created these. Yeah. But it didn't, we don't think. I don't really have one theory that I accept or endorse. Or I like the comet theory because it's sexy. <laughs> <clears throat> but Kazarowski's theory of oriented wind and wave action probably is going to prevail for a long time. Right, right. Yeah, I, I have seen uh, some, some good work on that theory as well. Yeah. Um, again, I mentioned um, Dr. Christopher Moore, and I believe he was on a team that did a lot of uh, research. Chris is in theory. our book a number of times, quoted in there. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's in the acknowledgments for the contributions he made. Good, yeah. good, yeah. Um, fantastic guy. Have you met him? I have not. Yeah, he's a fantastic person. I've uh, just been a big support to, to our research group at Seven Ages, and I appreciate everything, everything that he's done. Um, I, I had the, uh, the great privilege of working side by side with him on a, a project here in South Carolina up in Elgin, uh, just this past spring. It was a fantastic time. Would that be, uh, white 
White Pond. Yes. White Pond. Yeah, I've heard some site. good stories about it. I tried to find it one day and ran out of time. I, I got close. Uh-huh. Got close. I've been to probably um, 40 bays or more in mm-hmm. three states. I, I think they were saying that White Pond is actually not considered a bay for whatever reason. And, and again, the, the experts would be able to tell you more about that. But I think the, the White Pond is, uh, for whatever reason, not considered a bay. I had somebody tell me it was. I don't. I can't tell you. I've never seen it, never been there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can look at a bay and generally spot its characteristics. You know, the sand rim, yeah. the elliptical shape, the it northwest, the, the same southeast characteristics. It orientation. And um, they're beautiful places. You also have in South Carolina, over near um, Mineta, is a Janet Harrison Heritage Preserve, which is called a high pond. When you get up north in the coastal plain, you start seeing what they call high pond formations. And a lot of people believe, well, some believe that's a Carolina Bay in the making. They can't be sure Hmm. because no one knows exactly what creates them. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So you've been to a lot of the bays yourself. You've been down in them. Uh, you know, with the photographers yep. and taking pictures yourself. Savannah River site especially. They've got 300 bays down there on okay. that property. Yeah, we have a good friend down there, <clears throat> Shane Miller. Dr. Shane Miller is down there doing some work in one of the Carolina bays, a site called Swag, I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, it's just sort of part of the topper site complex oh, yeah. right right near there. And I think you, you said you've been down around in that area some. We put the topper site in <clears throat> Dr. Um, Albert Goodyear, yeah, Goodyear. Goodyear is in our book, South Carolina, uh, Reflections of South Carolina, Volume 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert went down there. I didn't make the trip. You know, the photographer, he's got to be there. The writer, he can he can skip by sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, we were actually talking about that. That's how I ended up meeting you, uh, funny enough. Uh, chance, coincidence, uh, f- a meeting of fate. Uh, <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was uh, at the Bistro on the Boulevard. The Bistro on the Boulevard here in Irmo, South Carolina. I was uh, deep in conversation with some folks who, as you mentioned, uh, as many have not, they, they had not heard of Carolina Bays, completely unfamiliar with with what they were. And I had just come right. off of the dig site at White Pond with Dr. Moore. And was excitedly uh, waxing philosophically with these folks uh, talking uh, about the Carolina Bays and, uh, the, as you said, the mysteriousness of their formation. And uh, and as I was mid-sentence and had just said the words Carolina Bay, Tom Poland sits down and <laughs> says, uh, who just, are you, sir? I just wrote a book <laughs> on the Carolina Bays. Yeah. <laughs> So I was I was uh, stunned, but it was a, a very good meeting, and I'm glad oh, that yeah. we got a chance to. Well, the book will be out in connect. December. Uh, USC Press is going to have it ready for okay. call day season. So it's a beautiful December. book. It's a big hardcover. And what's the precise name of the book? It's Carolina Bay's mysterious magical landforms. Great. Yeah. What's your favorite bay that you've been able to get, to actually go to? Well, I've been to a lot of them. Um, I enjoyed Jones Lake up near Elizabethtown, North Carolina. It was very beautiful. Robert and I went up there in um, in the fall, October, and camped out in a tent the night before, and it was a cold night, and there was a billion stars salting the sky, and it was foggy the next morning, and this particular Carolina Bay had this aurora-like rosy fog with the sunlight lifting it up. Beautiful pink setting, and it made a beautiful spread in the opening of the book. It's gorgeous. Enjoyed that place. Uh, Woods Bay State Park, which is over near Olanta between Sumter and um, Florence and over that part of the world. I think it actually sits across three county lines. That's what I call Easy Man's Bay because you can drive right up to it. It's a great boardwalk that takes you out into the thick, pecosin like uh, shrubby growth. You can walk across um, a dike to the adjacent mill pond attached to it. Most bays, because of their water, man has tried to make use of them over the years with mill ponds and whatnot. It's a great place to see wildlife, and it's about 80-something miles from Columbia. It's easy man's bay because you can just drive right up to it, walk in. Now, some bays, you got to put on waders, go out in the water chest high to get to where you want to be. Uh, they have snakes and alligators and stinging insects. We never had a problem with alligators or snakes, but I've been stung by wasps in uh, Wombaugh Bay, which is in the Francis Marion National Park. Red Bluff Bay is one of my favorites. It's in the Francis Marion uh, National Park, north of 17, above McClellanville. And gosh, if you want to see something pretty in the fall, go see Red Bluff Bay Hmm. when the leaves are normally changing. The pitcher plants go into fall colors. The grass zonations have fall colors. Different species of grass grow in zones. 
And you can look across the top of those zones of grass, and it's like someone took the rainbow and laid it down on the earth. You see the different colors in distinct bands. It's really interesting. Wow. You don't see that anywhere else. That's beautiful. That's brilliant. And, of course, your book <clears throat> is just loaded with full-color photos. Lots and lots of full-color photographs, yeah. Uh, everything from juvenile alligators to uh, canebrake rattlers to uh, orchids, Venus flytraps, pitcher plants, wide, majestic pictures of bays in the fall, the various stages of plants that you see in there, what people call ecotones, where habitats come together, uh, cypress swamps, pond cypress swamps, the grassy savannas, which have these beautiful green grasses. It's just gorgeous to see. I always, throughout the book, I made the reference every so often to, um, it was like going to Africa, like snapping your fingers and ended up in Africa right here in South Carolina. It's that kind of a wilderness effect you get. So the book is out in December. Right. Um, any big launch plans? Uh, you know, there's a few places here and there that are talking to me about having some signings. Spartanburg is one place. Here in Columbia is another. Um, it's probably just a tad early yet. You know, most of these people, they want to see the book, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. hold it in their hands and all. I think I think it's going to cost around $40, I believe, is the price, okay. which is reasonable. Uh, what's the best place to get it? Well, you can get it directly from USC Press. Uh, Of course, the major bookstores will have it if you can find a bookstore anymore. Gift shops like Uptown Gifts on Main, uh, Mass General, they stock all my books there, Uh, places like that. Fantastic. Well, Tom, I appreciate you coming by and uh, talking with us for a little while and um, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Um, Glad to be here. And we look forward to great successes from your books. All right. Stay tuned for more. (laughs) Thanks, Tom. All right. Thank you. Special thanks to Dan Newbanks for sitting down and talking with Tom Poland. Always great to hear from authors in the region and, of course, discussing subjects that are near and dear to our hearts here at Seven Ages. Now, with that, Jason, I think it's about time for us to head over to the state of Tennessee, where you and I recently visited, and we were in the company of some fantastic folks, which included David Dean, who we'll be discussing archaeology with, and, of course, our good friend Chase Pipes of the Chasing History YouTube channel. More about all of that after this here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So in our recent travels, Jason Pentrail and I headed over to Sevierville, Tennessee, and we were representing the archaeological podcasting community during a wonderful event that we participated in at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, which is run by our friend Chase Pipes. And it was a great time. And of course, live on location is always fun because you're there, you're in the moment, people are walking by, they're fascinated with what they're seeing and what you're doing. And of course, Seven Ages is there, not only with our gear and our audio equipment, but also with some samples to show people from Jason's fantastic collection of replicas of famous artifacts. This is a great way to be able to show people what these artifacts look like without actually having a priceless artifact there on hand, but nonetheless to be able to show people what these elements of the ancient past and the workmanship involved. It's a great way to do that. So Seven Ages live on location there at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. You can probably tell by the sound of the waterfall in the background that Seven Ages is live on location at the Smoky Mountain Knife Works in Sevierville, Tennessee. I am here, of course, as always, with Jason Pintrail, Waldo out there somewhere, but with us in spirit. Been a great day that we have had here in the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, surrounded by history and a lot of geology, too. Yeah, it's been a busy day. We've had a lot of people coming through. It's a rep weekend here at the Relic Room, Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Um, we came out, got our table set up. We've just been chatting with folks today about uh, artifacts and history, archaeology. Met a lot of fine uh, people coming through the uh, shop today. Big thank you, by the way, to Chase Pipes. You know, the minute that we met him, you reached out to him. We'd been fans of his Chasing History YouTube channel. And when we came here a few months ago on our way through the area, you and I stopped in and we met him. And he's one of those guys that you meet and you realize immediately, oh, this is going to be a friend for life. 
And so here we are. He invited us to come out here for the rep day. And we've had the wonderful opportunity to talk at length with Chase throughout the day. And again, this is someone who shares our kind of passion for history, reads constantly, listens to podcasts, uh, has very graciously promoted ours and told many of the folks here at the facility about it. And so we've met everybody and they kind of already know who we are on arrival. That's always a wonderful welcome when you arrive for an event like this and people say, hey, we appreciate what you guys do. And these people have an equal appreciation for history and archaeology. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? The the entire crew that we've met here today, the, everyone working here, the employees, everyone's been equally passionate. Um, you know, everybody's got their own area of expertise and everybody's helping customers uh, find uh, various things that they're interested in, from the minerals to the artifacts. And, you know, it's just kind of got a, a great family feel to it. A great day here at the shop overall. It really is. Now, one of the big takeaways for me, it's interesting how many folks have come by. They've seen you know, the layout, we have some replicas of different kinds of lithic types that we have on display, which we can use to tell people about what we do and to kind of give them examples of the kinds of things that interest us. But a lot of people have come by and they've asked about different kinds of television programming that's oriented around history, some of it more of the speculative variety. And the general takeaway is that everyone we've spoken to today will mention, for instance, a program on history or some other network, and they'll say, you know, I'm interested in this subject. I take all the television with a grain of salt, but my real interest is in, and then they'll talk about the Mississippian culture or something. I've been impressed by how many people take television and media for what it is, and they seem to have a legitimate interest in actual history, not just what they see on television, which is kind of, you know, that is inspiring in many ways for me, being a person who wants to advocate people going and finding legitimate source material to feed their interest in the past. Yeah, you know, and and speaking of that source material, this is a great place to be because there's such a wide array of artifacts that are here in the shop that pertain to all different periods of time, you know, everything from, you know, dinosaurs and and all the way up to World War II, Civil War, Revolutionary War, Native Americans. Uh, It's all here and it's represented in almost like a museum, if you will. And, you know, we've had people coming by today talking about the different time periods that they're interested in. Uh, We're out here, obviously, to not only uh, promote Seven Ages, but to be part of uh, the rep weekend that's going on at the Relic Room. But more importantly, we've had a lot of people coming by today that are just wanting to learn more about uh, family collections, about things that have been passed down generationally. And uh, it's been a great day. We've had other, you know, there's archaeologists here, there's other uh, local collectors, there's uh, academics, all sort of different people here helping folks learn more about things that they have in their own family. And I think that's really special. It is. It's always great to hear people's stories. And I have to say, Ever since childhood, really my first love as far as the sciences was probably geology. I used to love to go to rock and mineral shows, and there's a lot of that represented here too, and it really kind of reminds me, again, I see the amethysts, the geodes, and things like this. It reminds me of being a kid, getting involved in an interest in earth sciences, and I think that's one of the important things that you find because, of course, being in the lower level of the Smoky Mountain Knife Works, a building that's best known world-renowned, in fact, you know, for the knives and other things that they sell here, uh, outdoor apparel, clothing and the like. But to come down here and to see all of this history, the geology, you know, an interest in, you know, the ancient past, paleontology and things, it's a great way, I think, to get young people interested. I know that that was the case for me, and one day I want to take my kids to places like this and keep that interest alive, keep young people interested in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've been here, you know, seven, eight hours today, and we've seen... Uh, children coming through and and you see their face light up when they see something that's ancient, whether it's a dinosaur bone or a geode or any of the minerals, you can really just see them uh, become engrossed and interested in these things. And it's places like this, it's museums, uh, it's excavation sites with volunteers that really light the fire for the next generation of archaeologists, geologists, scientists. And uh, today it's just been great to, to have the opportunity to people watch and, and literally see, you know, a child come into an environment like this for the first time and their face just light up and you know that uh, that interest has been sparked and they're going to go out and they're going to learn more about this. And that's, you know, more than anything, I think that's one thing I've noticed today. And, and not only that, but 
being surrounded by so much diversity of history, it's led to some incredible conversations, not only with Chase, but with, you know, people passing by and, and telling the story of one time my father found this, my grandfather found that. And you can see that they finally remember these things. And so it, it's been a, a busy day of, of stories and knowledge and artifacts. And uh, to say the least, it's, uh, it's been enlightening, and I'm certainly glad that we've been here to be a part of it. And there's been a familiar element, too. You know, Andy Scholl dropped by earlier, and as we were getting to know him and talk to him, he mentioned, uh, do you know Chris Corley? And yes, we do know Chris Corley, good friend of ours, apparently a good friend of Andy's. And so, you know, a lot of our friends, Joe Wilkinson, Chris Corley, and goes without saying, our man Dan Newbanks. A lot of familiar names have come up today, and so it's always really good to be able to talk to folks here who know our friends out there. So, reporting live from the field here in Sevierville, Tennessee, Seven Ages, always on duty. And one of the great things about being at a live event is being able to sit down with different folks and have interviews for the public to see live podcasting. Uh, Really creates a lot of buzz, a lot of conversation, and we were able to do that with Tennessee archaeology legend, David Dean. Now, David Dean is a very well-known avocational archaeologist. He doesn't have formal training, but he's been involved with more archaeological digs than most people involved in archaeology in that region. He has a lifetime of information, a lifetime of experience, and has plenty under his belt as far as working with local universities, archaeologists, and he just has a lot to offer, had a lot of knowledge to give about Tennessee archaeology. And we were able to sit down and chat with him for about half an hour. Yeah, and David also is involved in a lot of education, too, which is really great to pass along information to up-and-coming students and avocationalists, you know, sharing ideas about how the archaeological process is carried out. And he is indeed a true professional. Joining us now, David Dean, who is a fantastic fellow and who has a wonderful lithic collection here. Avocationalist archaeologist, something we can relate to. And, of course, you've been involved in archaeology in the state of Tennessee for many years. How many years, in fact? I started in the uh, probably 1963, wow. 64, digging with the local chapters of Tennessee Archaeological Society. Uh huh. So, and, and that's that's one benefit I think I had as a an early uh, entry into archaeology, I was able to dig with people that were digging in a professional manner. Mm -hmm. So I was able, even avocational, I was able to uh, see what professional methods were being used. Absolutely. And of course, in more recent years, you've been assisting also with some of the universities in the area as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've worked with, uh, currently I'm working with the University, I mean, the uh, East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee. And we're currently working on a uh, uh, Boone Reservoir uh, uh, survey collection that was done in 2014 and uh, the lake actually was dropped an extra 14 foot for repairs on the dam and uh, it went 14 foot lower than it ever been since it was inundated in 1952 wow. so it was an opportunity for someone to go out and, and look at the, uh, the soil that had ever, basically never been uh, surveyed and I was able to find uh, like maybe 70 new sites. They haven't been given state site numbers yet assigned mm -hmm. to them, but um, field site numbers, there's about 70 new sites possibly that's going to come out of it. Oh, wow. And that's so prehistoric and historic, though, I mean, together. And so those yeah. are now going to be designated by the state as, as archaeological yeah, yeah. sites. Yeah, we've given the state the information, mm -hmm. and some of those sites I'm sure that were fairly close together rather than if the, if the cultural uh, uh, material is very similar and those sites are pretty close, uh, it might be that they just give one site number to two of my field sites mm -hmm. because there was very little right. difference in the cultural uh, components right. that were found. Yeah. You know, what fascinates me about you is, again, Jason and I, we are primarily avocationalists ourselves, archaeological enthusiasts. Um, many around here would say, as far as archaeology in East Tennessee especially, I mean, you're the go-to guy. And we first saw you in videos with Chase Pipes on Chasing History, some of his most popular videos, thousands of views, tens of thousands in some cases. Um, he really speaks highly of you. I want to know how you got involved and how you became sort of an authority in this region on archaeology. Is it just your life's passion? It, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I think a lot of people over the years, they they take a, a hobby as a as youngster. Like I started 15 or 16 years old, 
and they probably do something for a few years and they go into something else they enjoy doing, something else they might enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And then in a lifetime, they probably got five or six things they're pretty good at. Yeah. I've never veered very far from uh, the earth sciences. I've done paleontology. I had a rock and gym business for 22 years, so I, I know that part of it. Uh-huh. And I've done archaeology for the last 60 years. So I can, I, I can incorporate all of those. Is one your things. favorite archaeology, uh, maybe? Probably. Yeah. yeah, because it's, well. You love them all. I've also <laughs> got like 14 Pleistocene sites that I found in the area. Right, yeah. With, uh, with mastodons, and I've worked with the uh, Carnegie Museum. Mm-hmm. Um, I would... I would send bone material up to them that I would pick, and they would identify certain uh, animals. Mm -hmm. And they would say, if you'll wait till summer, uh, we can get an NSF grant and come down and work with you. And some of those sites, they took 100-pound bone out of. Peccary, dire wolf, ground sloth, giant armadillo. That's got to be exhilarating. Uh, Yeah. We got the first uh, badger uh, in Tennessee, out of this area. Uh, Parts of a giant beaver, they said was probably five or six foot long with a three foot tail on it yeah uh, it's only the second one family in the eastern united states at that time goodness yeah well i mean your your life in all of these disciplines and fields it, it almost reads like a greatest hits uh is there any one particular site that you've worked on any particular discovery that really stands out here in east tennessee over your lifetime of archaeology i would say uh maybe the eastman rock shelter that i excavated and the only, I, I think it's the, the unique thing about that shelter is that I went down like 14 feet in the ground. I hit bedrock, but every, at every level, I even found a broken Clovis down at eight and a half feet. Wow. And I found early archaic, middle archaic, late archaic, all the woodland, Mississippian. So basically that one site is kind of a, a, uh, cultural, uh, chronology of our area. I mean, that yeah. one site, we got probably 10 to 12 carbon dates at different levels so we know when certain periods of people were here and what they were what type pottery is associated with you know those points in those Mm -hmm. strata and so forth so yeah i would say just because the uniqueness of that well can you kind of for the listeners can you kind of describe what that site actually looks like i mean it's it's a rock shelter site correct yes it's very close to a river system yeah and so uh, size-wise, and were you sponsored by any university or anything when you were doing that dig? And how did that come about? Uh, I went to, I knew I had just moved back from Florida in 1979. I was down there for like nine years mm-hmm. in the 70s. And I came back, and I figured that site would probably have been dug because they had local uh, chapters digging around here right. that had dug major sites. And I went over there, and there was only like one pothole in the, in the shelter floor, and I'm like, you know, this thing's still here. The river's right in front of it. It's got to be something here. Mm-hmm. So I went to the Tennessee Eastman Company uh, and asked them if I could dig on their property. And they said, who are you? You know, right. yeah. <laughs> which I'd expect. And uh, I told them what I'd like to do. And uh, I said, if I get permission, uh, can you tell me how much of the material you expect out of it? Mm-hmm. It's your property. And uh, I asked them also if they would... Uh, could watch it with her uh, security people because they had trucks that drove around. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got a, a letter about a week later and uh, said that I could uh, I could excavate. I could keep all the artifacts because they were in the chemical business and they, they didn't have a place to be associated with rocks or artifacts. Sure. And their security people couldn't watch it because they had a it was a they they hired these other people out when they're on employees mm-hmm. and evidently they couldn't get that so basically once i started and saw what i had i had to stay there for two mm-hmm. months i mean they all two or three months i was there because i couldn't leave it was so obvious it's right beside of a major highway in king right. sports so but anyway i found out later i was talking to the uh dr charles faulkner at the university of tennessee and I was got him involved because I started finding some early stuff, uh, material. And uh, he said, yeah, I thought you, uh, I didn't know if you was digging up there. And I said, yeah, I'm digging and I'm finding uh, certain types of artifacts. And he said, well, yeah, we need to get involved in that, you know, or mm-hmm. see what's going on. So they made some trips up. And I told him about the, uh, how I approached getting, inf- you know, the permission and all of that, which you should do on any side. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
And he said, well, they called me, and he said, I remembered you doing work in, in, in paleontology. I don't remember you doing work in archaeology. But he said, I know you work with Carnegie Museum and, and Smithsonian at the, on those sites. And I'd feel comfortable enough to let you know to say it was okay. That's how I got permission. Oh, okay. It wasn't even that I knew, got it from archaeology background. It's from a, uh, the paleontology. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. But, you, I mean, you were qualified. You had some experience, of course, in the scientific management of excavation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'd, heard, I'd already learned a lot of that, mm-hmm. even, like, like I said, 30 years earlier, 20 right. years earlier. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you had experience. So, again, I know we... we hit some of the highlights of this but this particular rock shelter is fascinating and there is uh, if i'm not mistaken there is a chasing history episode about that rock shelter yeah correct yeah, yeah. and so uh you know what exactly uh, kind of give us a, a insight to the stratigraphy and as you were going down were you finding you know as you would expect uh, woodland all the way down to obviously clovis at some point yeah yeah i mean when i started the very top of it was uh, scoured pretty bad, mm-hmm. and a lot of the bedrock from the ceiling uh, roof off was actually exposed. So the only place I found a lot of good Mississippian material was actually up kind of around those rocks. It kind of got trapped. Material kind of got trapped, and then get washed away. Mm-hmm. But I found uh, found Dallas, what we call Dallas culture. Dallas yeah, culture? Yeah, in this area. It's like mm-hmm. 1400, 1650 A.D. Okay. I uh, found... Um, Things like McKee Island, that's, that's kind of a shell-tempered pottery that kind of uh, identifies that time period. Mm-hmm. Uh, found the projectile points that go with that, uh, the Dallas excavates, the Madison uh, projectile points. And as I went down, uh, that's what's good about archaeology. If you know what you're, where you are and you know some of the artifacts, you can see that cultural change. I right. was digging in six-inch layers at that time. Of course, now we dig in centimeters. We dig either yeah. five centimeters or ten, which mm-hmm. is basically two inches or four inches, depending on whichever way you want to go. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, as, as I went down, as soon as I got under the Mississippi material, I started seeing the uh, Lake Woodland material, and you start seeing what we call knot roughing, uh, net impress type limestone-tempered pottery. And so that kind of identified that time period with Hamilton and Curvate projectile points and so forth. And then you get in the middle woodland, you get, if they have their own pottery types for that time period, right check stamp, uh, Mulberry Creek Plain, whatever, limestone tempered. And then you'd find the projectile points that go along with that, uh, those ceramic types, uh, Bradley Spike, Swan Lakes, and so forth. Then early woodland was a good component part of that. It was like four foot. Uh, just early woodland material. And uh, that's the first pottery in Tennessee that starts in our area about 1,000 B.C. with what we call a uh, Watts bar, fabric mark, uh, and cord mark, uh, grit tempered, crushed quartz type temper. And you find those early woodland points again with that time type of ceramic. So if you know, if you know, if you know your point types and your ceramic types, you can identify, you know, when you're down mm-hmm. to a certain level, you're identifying the time period you're actually working with in that yeah, layer. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us about this Clovis point that you, you found. Was it fluted, unfluted? It was just the base of a Clovis point. And actually, I had gone through a sterile layer. Uh, it was getting winter time in 79. And I was kind of at a point I didn't know if I wanted to go any. I mean, I wanted mm-hmm. to go deeper, but I didn't know. I was below all the, the, the good woodland stuff i was low all the ceramic levels uh it started getting uh, pretty sparse uh, as far as material and it was just a lot of alluvial material in it real sandy and there was like a zone in there for about like a couple layers that wasn't almost nothing in it so uh i decided well i don't know if i want to get come back if i need to come back or whatever so i just took one unit i dug in five foot five foot squares and I just went straight down in one unit, and I got down to like seven feet, and I started finding some firecrack rock and things that kind of give indication that there was something going on. And I went down at eight and a half foot, uh, I found another living floor. So I knew it was going to have to come back uh, another year. So I waited until, I had to keep an eye on it, but I waited until like February. I think I missed about two months over there. When I came back, uh, people had been probing my side ho- walls and so forth and it was kind of tore up but the the thing the benefit i guess of it is they were covering my floor up 
I mean, I'd already done. I mean, yeah. I, I could go further, but I'd already gone to the roof line, the front roof line, and so forth. So, at that point, uh, I came and moved some of their dirt. Brought a wheelbarrow over there, moved some of the dirt, leveled it back out to the level I was at, and I just started excavating again. And then when I got down to about eight and a half, nine foot, I found a base of a broken Clovis point. At that point, yeah. but I also went below there and uh, found uh, Horace and so forth, even below that, but didn't find any artifacts Mm -hmm. that we could identify. That's interesting. Let's talk about that. How much deeper below what you identified as the Clovis level did you find a secondary hearth region? Uh, Probably, uh, I'm going to say nine feet, maybe, nine Mm -hmm. and a half feet. And the hearth was the only feature you found? No, there was a level in there. There were several... uh, uh, like little rock clusters and oh, really? so forth. Okay. And it wasn't hard. It was still pretty much intact. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of those rocks were collected and sent to uh, Washington University in uh, St. Louis. And uh, that was some of the first th- thermoluminescence dating that was oh, really? done in the state. At mm-hmm. that time, we sent, I sent some of the rocks out there. And they came back around 5,000 years. Oh, okay. So what as early as we'd like to, like to have, but... Uh, so that clove was evidently, and a lot of that colluvial material above there was being washed in. Mm-hmm. So very, it's probably was displaced. Yeah, so there probably right. wasn't. Well, yeah, being that close to the river, you'd have lots of redeposition of fluvial oh, ex- movement and all that. Exactly, yeah. that makes perfect sense. You know, yeah, that's one of the problems, I guess, when you're working a river site like that. Another site we talked with you about earlier today uh, was actually a cave on private property, which, of course, we won't disclose the specific location, but I would like to talk, if you can, a bit about that cave. Because uh, Chase first brought this to our attention. It's very unusual to find, uh, you know, fairly detailed artwork uh, in the form of petroglyphs or pictographs. This is a little different from either of those as far as rock art types. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the discovery of the cave and what exactly was found inside of it. Uh, the uh, in cave art in Tennessee, there are several sites. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's probably 40 sites. I'm guess probably more than that now. But back when I, at this time, there was like 40 or 50 um, cave arts. They call it cave arts. What it's known as in Tennessee. Yeah. A lot of it is in rock shelters, open air. But basically, uh, they're labeled. And they're not even given state site numbers, so they don't become part of the public record. Why wouldn't they be given state site uh, numbers? They don't want people to be able to find out oh, where they are. I see. So Got they're it. they're in Tennessee. They're given unnamed cave one, unnamed cave gotcha. two. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So nobody knows where it's at except for Smart. people that you know they have a handle on mm-hmm. it. And our cave art uh, person is at the University of Tennessee, and uh, this cave uh, I was told about. So I went up there. Probably four years ago, or maybe five, mm-hmm. and went up with a group of other people, uh, and we went into the cave and and uh, explored different places in there. Maybe found another uh, uh, petroglyph or something that that wasn't previously had been found. Mm-hmm. But the one interesting thing about it, uh, most of the cave art that's been recorded in the state was all pictographs it's mm-hmm. been painted on the walls or petroglyphs it's been either pecked or, or scratched or carved into the walls mm-hmm. uh, this is actually sculpturing where you have a 3d uh extending from the wall like right. a relief mm-hmm. and that's um, one of the few sites known in the whole eastern united states that has that you don't see it a lot no no uh, the rock art books that i've got that i've researched uh, they say they assume that it's there, but they don't give you any examples of where it's at. Yeah. So when we found this. That that what what seemed unique about it, and uh, one piece of charcoal was found on the floor. Looked like part of a ba- possibly a uh, burnt cane torch, which uh-huh. they would have used for their their light. Yeah. And we got a date on it, it like uh, A.D. 1600. Wow. That's just incredible. You know, I, again, I can say with confidence I've never seen anything, at very least in the eastern United States, but maybe in all of North, North America, quite like that. And yet it's not unlikely that there are other sites, perhaps if they could be found. I mean, there are so many karstic cave regions beneath Tennessee and this part, exactly. of, the, uh, this part of the country. To find something like that, I mean, what had that been like for you? Because I presume, again, you've probably never experienced anything in terms of rock art quite like that yourself. No, no. It's... Uh 
It's been very secretive. Sure. I mean, understandably, uh, people at UT know about it. Mm-hmm. A uh, professor at, at the Tennessee State University knows where it's at. Right. Of uh, course, they've been involved in you know examining and documenting it. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah. There was uh, there was like four hours of work done in there with sketching and photographing, measuring, mm-hmm. uh, and but the only thing is that nobody has really come out out front and said this is this or this is this because there's nothing to, what if you don't have anything to compare it to right. you, i mean <laughs> good point and a lot of people i know i know aren't going to be the first one to come out and say this is this because without any kind of previous investigation if they can find you know reference uh, a lot of times that's kind of bold to come out on that it is yeah. and you have to be very careful when you're dealing in the realm of speculation like that but if you were to make any kind of comparisons i mean would you even would you even care to try and speculate as to what they most closely resemble or is there anything that you've seen that they are similar to that you would liken them to in terms of the symbology if there is any um in appearance to other sculptures if there is any or anything else uh there was a sculpture in the 1880s smithsonian actually took a sculpture a statue that was free from the wall actually loose uh-huh. laying on the cave floor down in strawberry plains near knoxville and uh it looked very similar to this one okay um and they suspected at the time that it was actually carved in the wall and then cut away from the wall and they took it out as a free piece right and the reason it was uh, loose from the wall is actually it was probably carved in the wall and then actually cut out of the wall wow and uh so this one might be the same thing. They're maybe they're starting to carve this image into a wall and didn't get it finished for some reason. Mm-hmm. And and it's still a, a 3D uh, sculpture, but it's not completely finished. Mm-hmm. So, But with that, we don't know. I mean, uh, there's no way of knowing. Right. But uh, that's the only other one that, that's cl- close enough to be referenced. That's pretty tantalizing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, being... Uh, thinking that possibly they're carving into that dolomite which is probably three and a half hardness uh, they're using chert or, mm-hmm. or what we call locally flint right uh, they were probably using those tools to carve and that's a hardness of seven because that's a quartz mm-hmm. uh, i kind of assume maybe that by carving that they might be chipping some of those tools that they're using mm-hmm. and so i actually later came outside of the cave and did two one meter units and went down uh, 10 centimeters at levels, about six inches. And I was in the, I was hoping to find maybe where they had maybe their tools had gotten dull and they would bring them out into the daylight, maybe resharpen them. And I was looking for any kind of uh, lithic uh, flaking debris or anything laying out front. And I did find a complete Madison point. Oh, wow. That goes, uh, of course, that starts about 1,000 A.D. for us all the way to... 1800 if you want to go that far through the trade period Mm -hmm. uh it's just a basic triangle straight base straight straight side edges i mean it's just a basic triangle and uh but i did find some other uh, pieces of lithic material outside the cave and uh but there's work to be done yet and i've i've I've, i covered the area that i had, had excavated and filled it back in so if it's ever opened up again it has i know where my starting point would be right. if i ever go back but there is material out in front of the cave that's interesting yeah. that's really interesting you know you've been uh, involved for years working with a lot of up-and-coming young archaeologists um and you know you play a role i think as an educator in this uh, region many look to you for guidance assistance and you know inspiration um as a lifelong avocationalist archaeologist but one who has worked an awful lot uh, with professionals in the field, you know, what would you uh, share with young archaeologists in terms of, you know, getting them interested in how they can become more involved or, you know, pursue an education in this? Uh, yeah, it's basically you have to work with, with people that 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 have experience, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think today a lot of people want to get their information uh, the easiest way they can get it yeah. off the Internet or something. Uh, hands on. I, that's basically how you learn. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's how I learned, and that's the only thing benefit that I have probably over a lot of other people. That's the reason I can work with some of the professionals, is that over the years I basically have had handled most of the material in sixty years. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's available in this area, and 
thank God I've been able to recall, you know, what I learned over those right. those 50 years yeah. or whatever. And I can look back at what what I learned early. And I worked with students over at the East Tennessee State University. And uh, and uh, we just finished that Boone Lake. We're working on the Boone Lake pro- Reservoir Project, which is a mm-hmm. TVA project. Right. Which they got a contract. Uh, and that's what we're working on now, writing it up. But during this process, I was able to identify the projectile points. Mm-hmm. Uh, we found, I found 239 projectile points out there. That's unbelievable. Uh, as I identified them and the raw material they're made out of, uh, four or f- five students in the archaeology lab worked with me. Mm-hmm. And then we made up a comparative collection oh, wow. so they can use it in the future. And we did the same thing with all the tools. Uh, 355 uh, lithic tools were den- I mean were identified and uh, and those are all made a comparative collection out of it and the things they never heard of like denticulates and different tools you know what I mean yes uh, wow so we got all the tools that were there on it and uh, we're now in the process of doing all the ceramics the uh, pre-art, prehistoric ceramics and we'll have a comparative collection left over there for that and the students are over there are working with us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. You know, keep up the excellent work, and it's just wonderful to be able to finally spend some time talking with you, David. I'm sure it won't be the last time, and you're always welcome here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank you. Thank you. Great to talk with truly a legend in Tennessee archaeology, David Dean, who we first learned about, in fact, from the YouTube channel Chasing History, which is operated by our good friend Chase Pipes who was the reason for the season because he was the fellow who invited us over there. And Jason, I first learned about Chase and his educational programming on YouTube uh, through you a few years ago. And I think we both unanimously thought, yeah, we've got to meet this guy. But boy, we have really become great friends with Chase. Yeah, you know, Chase was one of those guys who just, he's got that energy more than anyone that you will ever meet. He has passion for history. He really, truly does. He lives it. He breathes it. He participates in reenacting Every facet of his life is connected to history in some way, shape, or form, not just, you know, one particular time period, but everything that has to do with history from dinosaur age right up to to modern history that's being made today. So you will not find anybody more passionate than Chase Pipes. And we had the opportunity to spend time with him, not only at his business, the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, but to spend time in his home. Um, you know, he, he allowed us to come there and speak with him and, and stay with him and his, his uh, girlfriend, Amy, at their home. And it was a wonderful experience. And we had a, a great fireside chat one evening. And we have that audio for you now. Concluding another weekend on the road right here and sitting cozy by the fire <laughs> in the Pipes Family Lodge, somewhere in an undisclosed location out here in beautiful Sevier County, overlooking a lake. Right here, the man in our presence, <laughs> Chase Pipes. Look, ladies and gents, if you don't know who this guy is, first and foremost, you got to head on over to YouTube right now. Just search for Chasing History. Jason, we've been watching this guy for years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when we started our own endeavor with Seven Ages, uh, again, we were looking for people and shows and programs and things that were similar and just to see what was out there. And I ran across Chase, and I was like, Micah, Come yep. here, you got to check this guy out. <laughs> yeah, and uh, here we are. Right? Yeah, it's a it's a mixture of, you know, it's 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 a mixture of Les Stroud and Indiana Jones, with a touch of Waylon Jennings. <laughs> so, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, right here, sitting in his living room by the fire, Chase Pipes, man, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Dude, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, I appreciate right on, it. I mean, no, this is this is great. I mean, we have absolutely had a blast hanging out this weekend, you know, really hanging out, getting to know you guys, and, and I love what you guys do. You know, ever since you guys came to the shop and I met you, first thing I did, hop on, check out the podcast, and I was just like, there's a podcast on Southeastern Archaeology? Are you kidding me? That is awesome, dude. I was just <laughs> stoked and ran through as many episodes as I can, and then we'll follow what you guys are doing. I love what you guys are doing, oh, so, man. you know, thanks for coming coming down to the shop you know we had a big once a year we have a big weekend at the shop where you know you know the thing is uh, so the relic room is located inside of a big knife store and so the knife store has like you know the reps from all the different knife companies and stuff come and so we kind of you know in our little section you know we have you know our own little kind of rep weekend where we have 
you know, a good buddy of ours, David Dean, who does archaeological work from the state. He oh, comes yeah. and sets up a table and talks about, you know, archaeology in Tennessee. And then we've got another friend, Butch Holcomb, who you guys heard, uh, you know, with American Digger Magazine, you know, and it's all about discovering history. And that's what we are. We're all history based. And we're so thankful to have you guys at the shop, you know, talking about seven ages and what you guys are doing, because that's what we're all about. We're all about promoting history you know we want people to get excited about history and realize when you look out the window something awesome happened here you know if, yeah. what is it let's figure out what it is let's get more people passionate about figuring out what it is absolutely i mean there are people who read history books i mean i read history books uh i go and i study history but i have met very few people and jason i'm sure you would agree that live history like you do i mean you have in an unprecedented way, at least as far as my own personal experience, you've brought the past into the present and you make it a part of today, which is part of what is uh, so fantastic about you because in order to convey history to people in a meaningful way, I think you've got to make it tangible. They've got to be able to experience it. Oh, for it. sure. Well, you know, it's 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 passion driven. And I mean, and it's not just one aspect of history. It's all of history. Dude, I'm a geek on all of it, man. I like the fossils and the meteorites, you know, uh, the archaeology history, you know, the history of NASA is fascinating. I mean, it's all fascinating as heck. But what we do at the shop is, you know, here, here's the thing you got to keep in mind is, is that, you know, humanity made a lot of stuff. There is a lot of things that humanity had made, and one of our greatest and, and easiest windows into the past is is by getting an artifact in your hand. When you hold something, you know, a prehistoric, you know, Native American projectile point, you know, or you hold, you know, a piece of the space shuttle, or you know, you hold a Civil War bullet, or whatever, you know, or a meteorite, or a fossil dinosaur bone, your your senses are on overload you're like holy cow that was there i'm touching it how cool is that well that effect is what i'm trying to get to as many people as possible by getting history into as many hands as possible you know and the simple fact is you know through the philosophy of you know inspiring people to create their own museums and home you know the simple fact is is that humanity made a lot of stuff there is not enough room in all the museums in all the world right. to hold everything humanity made so what do we do with all of these things that have been discovered that you know either on accident or on purpose that humanity has made you know how do we ensure to take care of that stuff and that's to build responsible collectors to take, bring that stuff into their homes and to be the caretakers, you know, for that for their lifetime. Because the, the fact is, is that none of this stuff belongs to us. You know, these artifacts belong to themselves. Yeah. We are just the caretakers, and it's our responsibility to ensure the safe travel of that artifact through our life and then to pass it on to another generation to somebody you know to take care of it for the next stage of its journey and so that it can do its job which is to tell the story of the history that it witnessed whether it be that prehistoric native american projectile point that's telling you know could there possibly be pre-clovis or whatever you know or uh, or you know a civil war bullet from a particular battlefield you know or or what have you these all these things have stories to tell and so i I'm, with the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, I'm trying to get this history into, this, into people's hands for as as affordable as possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, every era of history is covered you know, with the oh, work that yeah. you do. Absolutely. And you know what, what? What's one thing I love that that you always mention is you you bring in something like you know NASA and the space program. There's this misconception that history only has to do with the dusty, musty old past stuff that is so yesteryear that it's no longer relevant today. Think about you know our efforts right now to explore space, our efforts to get off planet and to be able to maybe even colonize neighboring planets like Mars. When we look at the space program of today we're looking at the history of the future oh yeah oh i like that yeah and well, history and, of the future and, and that's, Man, that's, that's the thing is that today's happenings will be the history of tomorrow yeah but think about the flint napping that occurred nine thousand years ago that washes ashore and that you find in a and this is very much the experience that jason has introduced to me when we're out in the field you know when you look so far in the past that was one person's present long ago mm -hmm. and we have to be able to remember that and i think that studying today and thinking of this as tomorrow's history helps us kind of put these things into perspective jason would you agree 
No, absolutely. And, and you know, even today as we're, we're at the event and we're sitting there and we're interacting with people in the shop and we're looking through old publications like Scientific American from the turn of the century and just looking at the innovations and where technology was in 1904 versus where it's at in 2019. And you still see that connection from an earlier time period to where we're at in 2019. We're still trying to conquer some of those same uh, trials and tribulations and learn and progress with technology. And, you know, several times today as we're up moving around the shop, I'm just listening to people yeah. talking and discussing. And I heard one young man say, is this real? Is <laughs> yeah. this stuff real? <laughs> yeah. and, and that's, you know, that's the impact of it. And that's why it's so interesting. And since we've been here for only two days with you, Chase, both in your home and at the Relic Room, and you've shown me no less than 25 items that I never knew even existed. And so even people like us here at Seven Ages who are passionate just like you are, I'm still finding myself going, there's still so much to learn and still so much to see. And when you can hold something, see something and, and bring it into your home and actually show it to others, there's an excitement that builds about oh, it because yeah. it becomes something that's not just a curiosity, but something that uh, takes you back to another time, but it also shows us where we're going as we move forward. Well, and see, that's what history is. You know, history is nothing more than, you know, everything that ever happened ever. All right. And it's our job of, you know, people in the present, you know, what, what, what can history tell us? What can history teach us? You know, history is the record of how everybody ever screwed up and how everybody was ever successful, and it is our job in the present to look back at the past and go, okay, well, that's how they did it, and they really screwed that up, so let's not do that. <laughs> you know, right. Or, man, they were really successful at that. Let's do it that way. And if we were to all to take that mindset into our everyday situations, you don't have to be nations or governments, even though that nations and governments should look at the past to, you know, to not to make these Certainly. tragic mistakes. But even in our own lives, you, know, you can look back in somebody's past you know, and learn from their mistakes you know when you yeah. when you're a kid and you put your hand on a stove and you burn the heck out of your hand you know not to burn the heck out of your hand you know but what if you could go back and read well you know somebody who put the hand on the stove and burnt the heck out of their hand you know you you know that history and that's why history is so important to study is, is because it is that record and when you hold these artifacts in your hand it gives you an added sense of it. you're using another sense you know it's your sight your sound your taste your, and your touch you know we really get it i mean it is just another way to connect to that history yeah absolutely when we met don and the guys today uh, you know who are professional reenactment uh, artists, actors, uh, and who go to great lengths to reconstruct uh, sets that resemble the past, which are often destroyed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they're reenacting, you know, the raising and destruction of encampments and villages and the like. Uh, they were talking about the fact that, you know, we don't just build cabins and wear period clothing and go out there and do this performance every day. Often we're spending weeks building a set and there's one performance mm -hmm. that we do publicly that is the most realistic depiction of, you know, a very, a very destructive event in history that can only be reproduced in such a way one time after all of that work. But they say the other side of this, too, is reading all of the historical documentation, the archaeological reports so that we can get the direct parameters. We're looking at all of the locations of the features in the environment during the excavations that tell us about how the structure was built, what the, the dimensions were, what the size was. He says, we spend most of our time reviewing historical and archaeological information to reconstruct these environments. And that's a very interesting kind of a parallel to what the historian does in a more academic sense. You know, we're trying to rebuild the past as a narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, history, again, it's a story of the past, but we can do a lot more with that. And I think that if you think about the way that, you know, uh, various reenactments, and you actually have done some reenactments yourself, I believe, correct? Oh, I love it, dude. That's how I disappear from right. it. If I want to go relax, I'll go dress up in 18th well, century garb and go hide. And that shows <laughs> that awesome. shows a very unique way that historical information can not just be read and studied and written about, but can be reenacted. Mm -hmm. And you can assemble pieces of the past based on very... Um, 
very specific information that's been recorded. And that's, I think, one of the, the parts of history that's so fascinating to me that, again, these are lives, these are people, these are very specific elements of their lives, practices, you know, daily routines. And we can glean that information and we can look. It's, it's more than a window to the past. We can rebuild that past. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and you as a historian, you know, as somebody that studies the past, you can only learn so much by reading the accounts that those people, you know, left for us to read. Like, you know, for their particular period, you know, their 18th century. We're, we're, guys, we're talking about Wilderness Road State Park. Martin Stations in southwest Virginia is a fantastic representation of what life was like on the 18th century Virginia-North Carolina frontier. Uh, mm-hmm. And you can only read about that in a book so much. Yeah. But as a as an investigator of history, when you actually go and you dress in the garb and you do the research to learn what the buttons were like and how they wore their clothing and why they wore that clothing, and then you go out into 90 degree heat wearing oh. that clothing or, you know, in, you know, 20 degree, you know, cool in a cabin in the middle of the night in January wearing that clothing. You get a whole new perspective on how, why they did things. And so when you go back to read that account, when you, when you read about how it was such a freezing cold night, you know, we had to, you know, you know, put more wood on the fire, whatever, you know, you have something in your own experience that you can pull back on that as a historian, now you can give it a richer interpretation because you've experienced it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what reenacting is so, that's what's so great about it. You know, and that's what I love to do. I love to involve myself in all aspects of history. If, if it can be done in history or in the subject genre of history, whether it is, you know, uh, go find it, go study it, go restore it, go reenact it, you know, go do a YouTube channel about it. If if it has something to do about history, I am on it. I love it. And reenacting is a black. You guys need to go reenacting. You people out there need to go reenacting. Uh, not not seriously, where it was you know accurate and all those type of things. But you know, there's another. There's a whole other side to this, and I definitely want to get this in and talk about this because uh, last night, as we're here in your beautiful home and, and here again tonight, there's something that is very unique that we discussed that I I find most endearing about having artifacts in your home and not just necessarily collecting them. And what I'm referring to is the fact that you have so many items here around us right now that are from your actual family Mm -hmm. uh, that have been passed down over the years and not many people can say that. So my question to you is, what does it mean to actually have pieces from your own family, your own heritage uh, to have here in your home, what does that mean to you as a lover of history? Oh man, I mean, there's nothing more incredible than you know, you know, holding something that your ancestor you know made or that your ancestor carried you know in a particular time or that your great great you know quilts that my great grandmother made you know. I mean, that's just such a it, it's such it it makes it really personal because that literally came from you. But you know, on family heirlooms, you know, here's the thing: you know, there's a lot of people out there who have family heirlooms, you know, uh, who are, this is one thing I face a lot in the shop. I have people come bring me their family heirlooms to sell because they don't have kids, you know, that they think will appreciate them. And my response to you is, is okay, well, you guys are in your fifties. You're still going to be around for a while. Wait for your grandkids or find an aunt or an uncle or somebody. It was your parents. You got brothers, sisters. It is so important to keep stuff in the family because that value is going to be far greater than the monetary value that you'll ever get out of that piece you know and that value to that family member is so much more but here's the other thing about you know what something that you were doing that I thought was fantastic is is you don't have to have something that's a hundred years old to have a family heirloom you can create your own family right. heirlooms right now all you guys out there listening if you don't have any family heirlooms Create them, and you will have family heirlooms. Pass them down to your kids. You know, you're doing a sword for your kid. It's so cool. <laughs> Shh. 
He can't what? listen to this. Yeah. Oh, no, don't no. let the kids listen. No, no, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. He doesn't, he doesn't know. There's only three. <laughs> There's only three. Okay. All right. <laughs> but but no, but 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 you're creating yes. a, a family heirloom. Absolutely. That is so cool. And that's something that, you know, I see I reach out to you guys out there listening. If you don't have family heirlooms, create them because they are a very impactful thing yeah. on your life. And especially if you're a lover of history, to hold that thing that was your family. Well, Jason knows one of my family heirlooms. Looms, and those are paintings my mom made, and she would just paint them because she just likes to paint. You know, but I remember when I moved into the house that I'm in right now, she gave me this painting of fairies, you know, around <laughs> a little pond. And actually, I always think people are going to laugh when they walk into my living room and see this painting of fairies, but they all say the same thing. They're like, wow, you know, what's that? that you know, that's an original painting. Did you do that? And I'm like, no, it's my mom. My mom did this. It's just a painting from my childhood that I loved. And when I was moving to the house, it was sitting in like a closet at her house. And I had said, you know, uh, are you ever going to do anything with that painting? And, you know, as I'm moving across town from where I was, was at the time into the house out in the country where I was, she said immediately, I didn't mean to like hint, but I mean, I really wanted to know what was going on with the painting. And she says, do you want that old thing? And I'm thinking that old thing that you painted just on a whim, I mean, to me is a priceless treasure. Mm -hmm. I want to pass that on to my kids, you know, and mm -hmm. maybe they'll pass it on to their kids and say, you know, Grandma Linda did this painting years ago and it was sitting in a, in a you know, a closet. You know, and Micah asked about it and it ended up on his wall for a while. And then who knows, maybe several generations from now, that painting, many of my mom's paintings, because she's painted everything from wildlife, as we know, to, you know, landscapes, all kinds of stuff. But I mean, to her, it's like, oh, these are just paintings. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. I hope one day a future generation will look at that as being a priceless piece of art that mm -hmm. was made by one of our family members. Like you're saying, that tradition can start at any time. Any time. Yeah. Any time. And see, and with any, and with any item, even the most simple right. items, you know, can be an excellent family heirloom. You know, but the, the, the whole point is is to find good homes for this stuff. Yeah. You know, there really is. There's more stuff out there than all of hu that humanity has made that can any that can ever fit in any in all the museums in all the world. Mm -hmm. And it is up to us as human beings to care for the history of humanity, whether it's your culture or not. You know, we're all human beings and we should all take it upon ourselves to care for whatever interests us. And that's what we try to promote at the Relic Room, you know, is we try to promote, you know, you know, people having that sense of I want to take care of that. No. Yeah, talking with Chase Pipes, who manages the Relic Room located at the wonderful Smoky Mountain Knife Works in Sevierville, Tennessee. He is also a fellow who's involved in everything from uh, doing videos for YouTube. You, of course, do a program on the radio and your own podcast. Mm -hmm. So uh, like a lot of the work that we do, I mean, what you do is very multifaceted. You're reaching a lot of people in a lot of different mediums. I want to ask you a little bit about the different ways that people can find some of the content that you produce and some of the things that you do. And then I want to get a really good story from the field about history from you. But <laughs> you, you have the radio show and the podcast, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've got uh, – so the, the – the radio show and the podcast are kind of all in one. You know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, simulcast locally here mm -hmm. on uh, Mix 105.5 and 106.3 The Mountain. It's uh, you know we're, we're I'm located in Sevierville, Tennessee. You know, right in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, it's the most visited national park in the country. Uh, you know, and this is the radio station for this area. And so every Thursday, you know, I do a 15 minute little radio show and it started out years ago, uh, you know, as just local history. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, here recently, you know, I've taken it and it's all of history. You know, it, it reflects, you know, my interest and the inter and the things that you will see in the relic room. You know, we talk about fossils, we talk about prehistoric native American history and archeology. span You know, we talk about the civil war we talk about meteorites you know we talk about every there's nothing if it's in history i'm on it and we're covering it and so what we do is is, is i'm on there with two great radio hosts you know uh steve and jay the redneck and the red coat and you know they're morning dj guys and they're hilarious and it's just a fun show to listen to and it's this british dude and this dude from down the hall or in tennessee you know and you know they got a radio show and i'm there talking history and we have 
fantastic conversations, you know, about history, but it's all themed around, you know, we're going to talk about a specific thing, you know, whether it was, you know, a site that we just went and visited with a museum group down in Texas, uh, we're going to tell the history of that site, you know, or whether it's, uh, you know, we did the history of Columbus Day was the last one that we did, you know, where did this day come from, what did it stem from, the history behind it. So, you know, the podcast is, is just these real short, you know, little 15 minute blips on really cool history, great for your morning drive, and it's, it, we try to make it funny if, if we can, but we also have, you know, once a month we have, you know, an hour long in depth you know conversation with you know uh, some of the men and women who are actually in the field discovering this history and this kind of gets more onto what our po- what our YouTube channel is about you know you know when we, when I started setting up the relic room you know I would have people come in the shop and look at this giant case full of dinosaur bones and go there's no way that's all real how do you know it's all real and it's like well it's all real because I'm getting it from the men and women who are digging it and they're like oh sure yeah whatever you know and I'm talking to some dude from Alabama no offense to anybody from Alabama <laughs> but I'm, I'm talking to some dude who just doesn't you know just he just he, they can't fathom that you can go out and find dinosaur bones yeah. or that they're common which they are common and you can find them if you know where to look. And that's what we do with with the YouTube channel, Chasing History, is, is we take you into the field and we put you face-to-face with the men and women that discover this history, and they show you how they find dinosaur bones. They show you how to metal detect for, for artifacts in the desert. You know, we show you how people hunt for meteorites. I mean, we show you how this is done on-site, in the field. We don't plant anything. There's a lot of videos where we just got a lot of content, and we don't show, you know, there's not a whole lot of, oh, wow, look, it's Billy the Kid's gun. You know, there's none of that stuff. It's true, honest content. And and so the YouTube channel started as that, you know, a way to show that, yeah, we really are getting this stuff from the people that discover it. And, you know, we want to teach this history. We want to make this history, you know, approachable. So we do. So what I started doing is, is recording, you know, a, uh, po- uh, you know, a hour long podcast interview with these people who this these are people that they've never been interviewed for podcast. You know, they've never really there's no you don't see people digging dinosaurs on the history channel or anything like that you know so it's it's a way for them to be able to tell their story and i'm grateful to do that you know and so that's what the 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 podcast is you know and that's what the youtube channel is you know so we we i try to involve myself in all this stuff that i can so if you guys get an opportunity definitely go and check it out absolutely what do you say jason i'd like to hear a good story well you know he's got him i mean Let's start with this story. How many miles do you think you've driven so far in 2018? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> I've got it. Uh, I've, I've got it. I've got it written down somewhere. I have to add it all up. But I'm at. Uh, uh, it's a 2013 van. I picked it up in 2017. It had like 30,000 miles on it when I bought it, and it's uh, a little over 300,000 now. Um, I did. Um, well, on the last trip with my Isaac, we did uh, we did uh, eight thousand nine hundred miles in twenty one days, what? and we did twenty eight states. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! This, this, folks, is a direct result of going to the places <laughs> like you described, going to the places where these things are being discovered, and bringing that to you through chasing history on YouTube and through the podcast. So, I just want again to attest to the fact that. You are actually going to these no, places, we're actually, yeah. and you're putting the miles, and you're putting <laughs> the time on the road away from your family and your friends and your girlfriend and everything that is your life here uh, to go out and bring this history to the public. Risking and, life and well, limb, well, it's, sanity, well, things no sane God would allow. <laughs> That's right. In my early days, man, if I had Red Bull and chocolate donuts, I was doing great. <laughs> yeah, I could right. drive to Canada, you know. <laughs> but, but I mean, I'm doing what you guys are doing, you know, actually going out into the field and bringing the stories of these men and women who don't have an outlet otherwise to tell their story, you know, and getting them to, you know, to tell their story. You know, we drove up to, uh, this summer, we drove literally to the Canadian border in Montana, you know, in di- to the dinosaur bear wolf camp, you know, where we got surrounded by timber wolves at one o'clock in the morning. That's a whole other story. Uh, from there, literally driving straight shot down to a stone's throw from the like we're metal detecting and 
there's the border with Mexico, you know, it, within that same week, you know, and coming upon camps of uh, border crossers, and there's tents and everything laying out there, and we're have we got our metal detectors and shovels in our hands. I mean, it's we travel all over the place to capture these stories because you know there are people that are discovering history, you know, in far off places, you know, where history can st- where really cool things can still be found, you know, and it's it's out there to find, guys. You know, histories, you know, fossils aren't rare. Archaeological discoveries happen all the time. It's just nobody's out. Out there telling their story, you know, and you guys are doing an awesome job telling the southeastern archaeology and the archaeological story. You guys are sharing things that, you know, I mean, it's really hard to find these stories, these finds, and that's what we're doing over on Chasing History. Is it's kind of that same thing. When I mean, we're we're kind of capturing a uh, instead of you know just archaeology, we're cap we're casting a wider net, you know, and capturing the fossils and the meteorites and the metal detecting and all the other crazy stuff that I find myself interested in. You know, we're capturing all of it and attracting timber wolves now we hear a little about you know panthers in our line of work but not timber wolves what happened with the timber wolves uh, <laughs> all right well so to, so this is a good buddy of mine Eamon Yeager uh, if you go into one of our podcasts actually the the night of the timber wolves we were recording an episode and you ah. can listen to that episode Ooh. you know uh but the wolves came later but so we're you know, to get there, I mean, we're, you know, an hour and a half from the nearest hospital. We're in northwestern Montana. You know, we are on this dude's ranch. The ranch next to it is like 50,000 acres. The ranch on the other side is 20,000 acres. We're on a couple thousand acre ranch, you know, uh, just below Glacier National Park. I mean, huge expanse. Uh, there, we're, we are armed. Uh, because it's the where we're at is the largest one of the largest concentration of grizzly bears in North America is where we're digging for dinosaur bones. You know there is no paved road anywhere near this thing. There is no gas station anywhere near this thing. I don't even think there's a Starbucks in the county. I mean we're in the middle of nowhere. Well, to get a little natural history, so they had an elk population boom, so they brought in timber wolves, because that was a genius idea, to bring down the elk population. The timber wolves ran the grizzly bears out of the mountains, so that's why the grizzly bears are around us. And the timber wolves have now moved out into you know the, 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 the plains, where we are at the edge of the plains and the mountains and the Rockies, and so now there are timber wolves around. So we're you know fixing to go to bed, just got done filming a podcast, the fire's dying down, and we just hear these crazy dogs just what we thought were dogs just barking just rah, rah, rah. i mean the loudest meanest thing i'd ever seen and we're right next to this kind of low ridge you know just 100 foot high little ridge and they're just barreling down at us and we're like what in the heck so we move the vans and we circle our vehicles around our tent should have known better because i'm camping in a tent my son and i are in a tent and the dude that digs out there every day aiming he's like i ain't camping in a tent there are grizzly bears here i'm, I'm sleeping in the truck you know, and so, you know, we took brush and we set up, you know, just this little like brush defensive borders like that's going to stop the wolf from charging into our tent. But they came right up to our camp. They surrounded us. You know, we, you know, we pulled out, you know, our pistol and just, you know, hoping we wouldn't have to use it. And it sure. was just a standoff. And we built a big fire up as big as we could. And, uh, you know, they're just barked all the way around the camp and then just took off. But there was about 30 minutes of just, we're, the, we're scared half to death. We're dog you know, food, we're, baby. We're food, man. <laughs> we're right nowhere near nothing. We're there. Oh timber wolves, you know, that are that are surrounding our camp. I mean, it was just creepy. It was cool. It was so awesome, man. And and I had my son, you know, who he's 13, and I've taken him on these trips since he was fine. And, I mean, that was just the coolest thing to experience, you know. And that's just the thing is, is there's still adventure, you know, in in, in the United States, in this world to go find, and sometimes it'll find you when you least expect it, you know. Well, that but, is absolutely uh, true. But, so we call that, you know, dinosaur bear camp, you know, because <laughs> grizzly bears, dinosaurs, and timber wolves. So. You guys may have seen the beer commercials, you know, the most interesting man in the world, but I think I've actually finally met him. Chase Pipes no. right here. Where can no. folks find you online? 
So you guys can find me online. We're we're we, we are in Tennessee, and so we're we're, we're working really hard on, on all, our social media and everything like that, you know. But we've got uh, uh, Instagram at Smoky Mountain Relic Room. We've got Facebook uh, Smoky Mountain Relic Room and Chasing History. Uh, they can find us at www.therelicroom.com is another place that you can find us. Uh, you know, follow us on our social media. That's the best place to keep up with all of our adventures. You know, I am on uh, Instagram. Uh, you can look me up at Chase Pipes at Instagram, and um, our you our. Uh, podcast is is chasing history radio and it's available wherever your podcast are please if you guys get on there and you enjoy it please subscribe and if you like the podcast please give me a review man i would greatly appreciate it same thing goes for the youtube channel you can find our youtube channel chasing history on youtube it pops right up and there's all these awesome videos of out digging history with the men and women that are in the field doing it. Mr. Pipes, thank Dude, you, brother. Thank you guys so yeah, much. Come and, back. and I yeah. appreciate what you guys do. Keep Ooh. doing what you guys are doing because we need more. We need more of Seven Ages. Dude, this is an awesome po- You people out there, you're listening to an awesome podcast. <laughs> you know, keep, continue to listen to these guys. These guys are great and they are doing awesome. Awesome, awesome work, and I'm so thankful, you know, to be a part of it. So Look, any more guys. of this, and it's going to be eight ages, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Chase Pipes, thank you so much, cool. man. Thanks, appreciate dudes. you, appreciate buddy. it, man. Thank you. Special thanks again to Chase Pipes of Chasing History and the Smoky Mountain Relic Room uh, for being wonderful hosts to Jason and I. I'm sure it won't be the last time. We have many adventures ahead of us, and I certainly look forward to all of those. And, of course, to hearing from all of you guys out there. If you enjoy this program, like Jason said, closer to the beginning of the show, rate and review on iTunes. And you can also, of course, follow us on social media, all the platforms are available. You'll find Seven Ages Research on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and of course at sevenages.org. Well, my friend, I guess I've got some packing to do for this trip that's coming up, and you're going to be hitting the highway fairly soon, I think, and headed home as well. So I certainly hope that our paths cross again fairly soon. Oh, I'm sure they will, and I just want to wish you safe travels, and I know you're going to come back with all kind of fascinating things to discuss. I certainly will. I always do. So we'll have a lot to talk about on future editions of the program, and I'm also hoping to get in a little Christmas cheer with one of these live programs we like to do with the Seven Ages Research Associates. Who knows? By then, maybe we'll find Waldo. And then the answer to the proverbial question will be known. So on behalf of the Seven Ages Research Associates, Jason Pintrail, and I am Micah Hanks, we wish you guys a happy holidays, and we will catch you next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm -hmm.